Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Vakas Shafiq, uh, and I am accompanied by Dr. Ahmed Imran Siddiqui. We both are consultant endocrinologists at Shokat Khanam uh, Cancer Hospital and Research Center, Lahore. I would like to welcome all of you to endocrine oncology session. Uh, it's a hybrid session. We have first two talk which are virtual. We will take question and answer uh, at the end of the third talk. So our first talk is on evaluation and management of thyroid nodule by Dr. Rahila Khwaja. She's a consultant endocrinologist at Ohio State University Hospital, USA. So we'll start with the first talk. This is Dr. Rahila Khawaja. I'm clinical associate professor in the Division of Endocrinology at Ohio State University Medical Center. It is my pleasure and honor to present the topic of thyroid nodule evaluation and management. We will be going over 2015 American Thyroid Association guidelines and 2017 thyroid scoring system from American College of Radiology regarding imaging workup and long-term follow-up of thyroid nodules. These were published in 2017. Let's start with the case. A 60-year-old male established his care with you as he has been recently diagnosed with prostate cancer. On physical examination, he's found to have enlarged thyroid with the right lobe nodule. He has no history of radiation to head or neck. He thinks that one of his remote cousin has had thyroid cancer. The rest of his examination is normal. Which one of the following is the next best step? Should we ask him to come back in six months for neck examination, order a CT scan of the neck, ultrasound of thyroid, refer him for surgery, or refer him to genetics? So what is a thyroid nodule? Thyroid nodule basically is defined as a discrete lesion within thyroid gland, which is radiologically distinct from the thyroid parenchyma. Thyroid nodules, they come to clinical attention when noted either by the physician or by the patient. These can be incidentally noted during a radiological procedure, which, is, which could be CT scan, MRI, carotid ultrasound, or a PET scanning, which is done as part of workup for different other cancers. Worldwide, it has been reported that 5% of females will have palpable nodules and 1% of male have, have palpable nodules. Ultrasound is a big tool to diagnose um, thyroid or detect thyroid nodules up to 80% of all the patients. It has been reported that new thyroid cancer or the prevalence of thyroid cancer is increasing over the period of years because of the use of ultrasound for thyroid nodules. This is a Korean study which has been published in 2018 in the Korean Journal of Internal Medicine to look at the prevalence of thyroid nodules according to age and sex when they use the ultrasound. So as you can see, a couple of things here. As the age advances, then the number of thyroid nodules increase over a period of years. Similarly, they also noted that the females, uh, they had more number of nodules as compared to the males. So thyroid nodules are very, very common feature. What we really are more concerned, which thyroid nodule needs workup and needs further, um, uh, further attention. So uh, there are certain risk factors which predict malignancy. Childhood head or neck radiation, any total body age radiation done for bone marrow transplantation, now, ionizing radiation, especially after Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki fallout in uh, those children, uh, in Japan especially, or even if now they, they live uh, all over the world. Um, so that history of, of ionizing radiation is a risk factor. Family history of thyroid cancer, 
or any thyroid cancer syndrome, which could be autosomal dominant because of different genetic um, abnormalities, P10 hematoma tumor syndrome being one of them, or in other words, known as Cowden's disease, familial adi, um, uh, adenoma polyposis or carny complex. MENQ, which is multiple endocrine neoplasm, part uh, number two, a history in a first degree relative, it is uh, in those patients, medullary thyroid cancer is the most common feature and the prevalence of medullary thyroid cancer is very high in those patients. A physical examination, if somebody is complaining about hoarseness and is found out to have vocal cord paralysis, cervical lymphadenopathy, or a fixation of the nodule to the surrounding tissue are the important physical findings to look for a, in a patient who has been presenting with thyroid nodules. So as we already mentioned that thyroid ultrasound is being used uh, more frequently and that is the tool to not only detect small nodules, but look at the different locations and um, characteristics of that particular nodule. So just to give a brief overview, we use a linear probe and there is a leading edge or which is usually, uh, there's, a, there's a ridge here or a light, different ultrasound machines have a different um, kind of a leading edge to let you know that leading edge should be towards the patient's right hand side. So when you look at the image, you know which uh, image is belonging to the right side of the patient. So here is a cartoon which is showing you trachea, which is, which is in the middle, and thyroid, um, right lobe of thyroid on the right side of patient is the most left lobe. Lateral to that is the carotid artery, and lateral to carotid is the jugular vein. As you can see, the blood vessels, they are looking like very, very dark. Uh, and similarly, the air in the trachea is also looking very, very dark um, uh, uh, on, the, on the imaging. This is um, sternocleidomastoid muscles, subcutaneous tissue, and the skin. On the left side of the image, sometimes um, it is very obvious to look at the esophagus. And if you ask the patient to swallow, they can, uh, you can see it moving. Uh, very clearly. The, the color or echogenicity of the thyroid lobes has been reported as, um, uh, it, it's usually very homogenous like salt and pepper, which is a normal thyroid, and the echogenicity is slightly grayish, or we call in ultrasound language hypoechoic. There are different different grades of being hypoechoic, um, but it is uh, uh, grayish as compared to the surrounding tissues. Now, when the ultrasound is reported, um, whether it is done by, by endocrinologist or it is done by our radiology colleagues, uh, we should be getting thyroid um, size in three dimensions, which are transverse, anterior, posterior, and longitudinal. And then it must be reporting the uh, parenchyma of thyroid lobes, whether it's very homogenous or heterogeneous. Number of nodules and their location is very important. And then these are the certain characteristics which, which we should have in our ultrasound reports. What is the size of that nodule in, in three dimensions again? Composition, whether it is solid, it is cystic, which is fluid filled, or it is a combination. Echogenicity, whether the thyroid nodule is slightly darker than the surrounding thyroid parenchyma, or if it is isoechoic, means it is the same echogenicity as the thyroid lobes. Or hyperechogenic means it's a little bit whiter than the rest of the thyroid parenchyma. Here I can show you some uh, different uh, uh, degrees of hypoechoic nodules. So this nodule has been reported in the right inferior uh, lobe. As this is a transverse image, and you can see the gray area of the nodule is slightly more grayer than the rest of the thyroid parenchyma. Thyroid looks like homogenous. This is another nodule, which is um, taller than wider, and that is a slightly even darker than the above cartoon. So shape also is important. And then another feature which is important to be reported if present in that particular nodule, if there's any calcification, and there are different types of calcification. Sometimes there are micro calcifications, macro calcification, or a peripheral calcification, which is sometimes around the nodule. Uh, vascularity, uh, in 2009, um, ATA guidelines, 
vascularity was given a, a risk factor, especially if there was a central uh, vascularity in that particular nodule. 2015 guidelines are not paying so much um, pressure on the vascularity because it's very, very subjective. In any ultrasound report, we should be uh, mentioning cervical lymph nodes. Normal cervical lymph nodes are very elliptical. We call it like a football shape. And there's a hilum, which is a white line inside. And the cerv cervical lymph nodes are more important. The patient had thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer. And now you see abnormal lymph nodes, which are more round. They have loss of um, hilum, or there are some calcifications in that lymph node. So based upon um, the ultrasound features, I'm just going to present what are the high suspicion um, nodules from American Thyroid Association. So to make it simple, so high suspicion nodules are usually solid and hypoaquic nodules. Or if the nodule is solid cystic, the solid component of that nodule should have any of the following um, features which could be irregular margins, any micro calcification, taller than wider in shape, any ex evidence of extra thyroidal extension, or any nodule which has irregular margins, but it has a suspicion lymph node. Now, uh, any rim calcification uh, of the nodule with some extrusion into the soft tissue component. These nodules are highly uh, suspicious. 70 to 90% of those nodules could have some malignant component. Now, as compared to high suspicion nodules, the intermediate suspicion nodules are those which are also solid. They're hypoaquic, but they do not have any of the above um, features. Now, for both these nodules, American Thyroid Association recommends to do a fine needle aspiration if the size of the nodule is more than one centimeter. So basically to decide if the FNA is needed, we need to have a certain size and characteristic of that particular nodule. The low suspicion nodules, very low suspicion nodules and purely benign cystic nodules. So here the size criteria is a little bit different. So for a low suspicion nodule, these, these categories have none of those suspicious features, but the, they are, of course have to be solid nodule. But uh, low suspicion nodules are either isoaquic or hyperaquic, means either they are the same color as our surrounding thyroid parenchyma, or they are a little bit whiter than the rest of the thyroid tissue. Uh, you can do the FNA if it's more than 1.5 centimeter. In very low suspicion, you can do FNA more than two centimeter. They are usually solid cystic or a spongy form type nodule. And purely cystic nodules, um, uh, you don't have to do a biopsy, but if the size of the cyst is more than is enlarged and patient is having pressure-like symptoms because of the um, fluid in the nodule, then you can always aspirate that fluid to give a symptomatic relief to that patient. So this is um, just I put all those features. Um, you can have um, this slide as as a reference point for all the different um, nodules characteristics to categorize into each category. So what is the TIRAD scoring? So TIRAD is basically thyroid imaging reporting and data system. So basically, if you pay attention to these, um, the composition and the different features uh, which were described in American Thyroid Association, uh, American uh, College of Radiology is also considering the same features, and but they are giving a point scoring system. The higher the suspicious feature, the score point is higher. So if it is a uh, solid, completely solid, they are giving two points. Now, hypoaquic, as you can notice here, they said hypoaquic or very hypoaquic. So it's a different shades of gray. The higher the shade is, the more uh, scoring it is. Then taller than wider is one. Any margins, if they are extra thyroidal extension, that high, high scoring point. Aquagenic foci, small, calcification is given a higher scoring point. So this sum up um, for any given nodule. According to the points, the higher the points are, highly suspicious the nodule is. And of course, the chance risk of malignancy is higher as the suspicion goes up. 
Now, as um, you can see the difference here for a high suspicion nodule, they also recommend again to do the FNA if it's more than one centimeter. But if it is highly suspicious and the size is between 0.5 to one, they recommend to do a follow-up. Um, similarly, for a they're divided as mildly suspicious or more, moderately suspicious. And the size point where they are giving us, um, where we, we, we should be doing FNA is a little bit uh, bigger as compared to what the American Thyroid Association guidelines have uh, recommended. This is a very recent paper published in Lancet, of, uh, Di Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. Um, they uh, basically, um, what they have said that the, these both guidelines, whether they are American Thyroid Association or thyroid scoring system, there is some overlap. But the main part, point is to look at those suspicious features and then decide which nodule needs a biopsy and which nodule needs a follow-up. Uh, actually, at Ohio State our University, we had been getting all the ultrasound reports from our colleagues in, in radiology and the ATA guidelines. Very recently, I should uh, say since September, they started using um, ATA um, uh, thyroid scoring system uh, to characterize each particular nodule. And it has, um, uh, when I check with them, actually, some of the um, U.S. Um, uh, academic centers have recently started using thyroid scoring system because um, of the reason that they can give a score point and to better characterize that nodule suspicious features. And their um, uh, size criteria is a little bit uh, lenient as compared to American Thyroid Association where you should be performing FNA. So in our patient, of course, ultrasound was done and uh, we got the report that patient has uh, in the right inferior lobe, a solid hypoacuate nodule, measuring 1.5 by 1.2 by 1.7 centimeter. So um, from American Thyroid Association, it is, it is um, categorized as intermediate suspicion. And from thyroid, um, they gave four, four points because of it being solid and hypoacuate. So what should we do next? Should we put a needle in? So as we all know, thyroid ultrasound will tell us the, about the structure of the thyroid or the composition of the nodules. But the TSH will tell us about the function of thyroid. So we definitely want to know how the functionality of that particular thyroid is. So if the TSH is normal or if it is high, means if patient is euthyroid or hypothyroid, we can go ahead and do the fine needle aspiration. On the other hand, if the patient's TSH has been low, we can get thyroid uptick and scan in that particular patient, provided there is no contraindication, which could be if the patient is pregnant, had a CT scan in the last with the contrast in the last four to six um, uh, weeks, or patient is on amiodrone used for atrial fibrillation because of its high content of um, iodine. By doing thyroid uptake and scan, basically, we want to know if that particular nodule, which is seen on the ultrasound, picked up radioactive iodine or did not pick up the radioactive iodine. If it does not pick up the radioactive iodine, that nodule is called as cold nodule. And the suspicion of uh, thyroid cancer is higher in cold nodules. The nodule, on the other hand, which picks up more radioactive iodine is called hot nodule. We do not do the fine needle aspiration. Instead, we treat those patients for toxic nodular goiter. So this is a summary slide again, putting the risk factors, family history, radiation exposure, or MBN2, size of the ultrasound and uh, size of the thyroid nodule and the features of that particular nodule are the um, uh, defining uh, 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 defining features for us to decide if the, not that particular nodule needs a biopsy. Then we look at the TSH, if high or normal TSH, or a cold nodule or radioactive iodine should be biopsied. We always use our ultrasound uh, probe and a syringe with 23 or 27 gauge, depending upon your preference, to guide the needle directly into that particular nodule. So is, uh, are there any um, can, uh, benign nodules? Yes, majority of the nodules, in fact, depending upon which study you are looking at, 
90%, aged 90% of the nodules are benign. And that could be because of multinodular goiter, Hashimoto's thyroid, assessed in that uh, particular thyroid, uh, follicular adenoma. This is a histological diagnosis. It means there are microfollicular cells and they are encapsulated. Now, one thing which I would like to um, discuss, there was previously um, called non-invasive follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer. But now it has been under benign category. The reason is because these are follicular tumors. It has some papillary-like nuclear features, but they are encapsulated. So that's why they are under the category of benign. Any hurdle cell adenomas, as uh, we all know, in the malignant category, papillary thyroid cancer is the most common one. Follicular thyroid cancer uh, and papillary, they are from follicular thyroid cells. Medullary thyroid cancer, is in ME and CHU, and they arise from C cells of thyroid, of thyroid and they are uh, secrete calcitonin, though papillary and follicular uh, thyroglobulin is their tumor marker. Anaplastic is very, very rare. Sometimes we uh, find out primary thyroid lymphoma, which is um, especially in those patients which uh, have Hashimoto's and there is a sudden enlargement of thyroid um, uh, gland. Um, and it's also a cytological diagnosis. Metastatic thyroid car carcinoma is also reported, especially with the breast and renal cell um, thyroid cancer. So in our patient, we did perform a final aspiration and it was reported as follicular lesion. So what do we do now? Should we do right lobectomy? Should we do total thyroidectomy? Order thyroglobulin? Order PET scan? or do a molecular testing. So let's go over some um, cytological classification, which has been used um, to report thyroid nodule cytology. It is called the Thista system. So they categorize from non-diagnostic non to malignant. So the estimated risk, if it is non-diagnostic, is one to 4%, but actual risk of malignancy after surgery is 20%. So of course, if it comes back non-diagnostic, you um, repeat the FNA. Usually we give a good eight to 12 weeks before we repeat the uh, FNA. Then the benign category, uh, it, uh, category three and four, I'm gonna come back to that category. Now, but here you notice if it's suspicious for malignancy or malignant uh, lesions. So estimated risk of malignancy and the actual risk of malignancy, both after surgery, they're higher. So what are these two categories? Atypia of undetermined significance or follicular lesion. So there, um, these, uh, when these categories were reported hysterically, historically, these are indeterminate net lesions, meaning it's very difficult on cytopathology to say if it's a benign or if it's a malignant lesion, because there could be some um, atypia in the, in the nucleus, or there could be follicular lesions, which could be microfollicles, mac macrofollicles seen in that specimen. So we needed to do diagnostic lobectomies or even thyroidectomies for more than one lesion um, uh, to see if it, it is a malignant lesion or benign. So number of surgeries, for, for these kind of categories were much higher. To overcome that, uh, in the last um, couple of years, now we have genomic sequencing classifier called a pharma. So it, it is usually at the time of biopsy, we save a small specimen. And if we get the cytopathology in these two categories, depending upon the patient's insurance, we send those specimens to California for this um, genomic sequence classifier. If, it usually takes two or three weeks before we get the results back. If it is benign, then the risk of malignancy is really very, very low. If they report that specimen to be suspicious, then it could be 50% chance of malignancy. And those specimens are usually, um, those patients usually are referred for surgical, um, for surgery. Are these this the, um, are there any other um, current molecular diagnostic tests available? So Affirma was the first one, but there are some other tests also which are used right now, which is thyroseq or thyrogenics um, uh, test available. 
they have a very um, good negative predictive value approximately 94 to 96% means it is a good rule out test. Um, if we have this test available, we can avoid diagnostic lobectomies for those indeterminate lesions. Actually, I was curious to find out if this test or any of these tests are available in Pakistan. So what I've found out so far, um, it is not available and um, it's very expensive test if it is um, if, if it is going to be available there, um, the company had told me that probably uh, out of US, it is approximately five to $6,000 um, uh, test. So I'm not sure if, um, uh, if you guys will be having these tests in the near future available for these indeterminate lesions. So what are the factors which may influence your choice of management for these indeterminate thyroid nodules? how suspicious the nodule is on the ultrasound, if patients having any compressive symptoms that might um, need the surgery, or sometimes the patients here also in our clinical practice also, sometimes the patients, they don't want us to send the pharma specimen for those indeterminate lesions, or even sometimes they say for benign nodules, they don't want to do follow-ups, and they said, no, we just want the surgery to be done. Few words about any role of suppression therapy for thyroid nodules. So NGA guidelines clearly says there's no role. If the patients are youth thyroid, we should not be starting those patients on thyroid hormone to keep their TSH on the low normal or low side to avoid unnecessary T4 um, uh, uh, to, uh, with the idea to keep the nodule sites suppressed because those nodules might still uh, become enlarged. So in our patient, actually, the, um, uh, when we send the pharma, it came back benign. So what do we do now? Should we do a follow-up ultrasound or should we, um, uh, should we just leave them alone? So American Thyroid Association and the Thyroid um, uh, or American College of Radiation, um, um, the radiology guidelines, there's little consensus. What the American Thyroid Association say is that if the FN is benign, so for high suspicion to intermediate suspicion nodule, you can do a repeat ultrasound in a year, which is a very reasonable time for a nodule um, to be followed up. And depending upon the suspicion, you can increase the time interval. Now, if there is a 20% increase in at least two dimensions of that nodule uh, in the solid area, FNA is um, again recommended to be repeated. If on the initial ultrasound, there was no FNA criteria, and but the nodule was very high suspicion, mean it's 0.5 centimeter, then of course um, you can do the ultrasounds a little sooner than that, and then decide if the nodule deserves a biopsy. On the other hand, uh, American College of Radio Radiology, they say for TR5, which are their high suspicion nodules, you can scan every year for up to five years. But uh, the TR4 or TR3 lesions, of course, you will do an ultrasound in a year, which is similar to what ATA guidelines are saying. But they have given different time intervals to follow these nodules. But they are saying that you can stop the imaging at five years if there's no change in the size. Um, American Thyroid Association actually have not given us any definitive guidelines when to stop the ultrasound and uh, they left it up to the provider and patient uh, regarding the periodic ultrasound, um, uh, and they did not give us a definitive guidelines. So what do we follow uh, basically, or what do we, what we should be doing? Um, that's between the patient and the provider. You can decide the time interval or whichever guidelines you are going to follow. Now, if the patient has biopsy proven differentiated thyroid cancer, for more than four centimeter, or if there's a suspicion lymph node or distant metastasis, total thyroidectomy is recommended. Whether we should be just doing a lobectomy for those uh, thyroid cancers, which are between one to four centimeter, then uh, it has been recommended from American Thyroid Association, either lobectomy, if the other lobe is totally clean, or total thyroidectomy is a reasonable um, choice, depending upon uh, once you discuss with the patient, the only difference is that radioactive iodine is um, uh, cannot be done if we only do lobectomy and the tumor size is more than one centimeter. 
if the size of the thyroid cancer is less than centimeter, then lobectomy is a very reasonable choice. So basically in summary, uh, in likelihood of cancer and the nodule, especially the ultrasound features are very important. Based upon the likelihood of cancer, whether uh, we should be doing FNA um, and, or, or uh, repeat ultrasound, depending upon the size criteria and the ultrasound suspicious features, depending upon the cytology, the options are whether we observe, we repeat FNA if, if indicated, molecular diagnostic testing or surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions if you have any. All right, so we'll have the question on session at the end as Dr. Vakas said earlier. So we will now move on to our second presentation and that's on endocrine effects of treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And that will be by Dr. Fahad Wali Ahmed. He's a consultant endocrinologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Fahad Wali Ahmed. I'm an endocrine consultant at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Medina. I would like to thank the organizers by inviting me to 21st Shokat Khanam Cancer Symposium to talk about endocrine effects of treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I will briefly discuss general information regarding tyrosine kinase inhibitors and its general side effect. The bulk of my talk will include endocrine side effects and its management. The first TKI approved by FDA was imitinib for management of CML in 2001. In the same year, a type vaccine uh, had a cover page which described imitinib as a new emanation in the war against cancer. TKI usually act on pathways involved in growth, avoidance of apoptosis, invasiveness, angiogenesis, and local and distant spread. As a result, TKIs have become a cornerstone in the treatment of many cancers, which includes CML, myelofibrosis, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, medullary thyroid cancer, melanoma, bowel cancer, and renal cell cancer. The list of cancers treated with TKI is growing. And so far, more than 50 TKIs have been approved by FDA. Despite its increasing use, uh, TKI faced several challenges, which includes drug resistance and side effects. The side effects of TKIs are usually dose-based, with broad side effects profile unique to each drug. However, due to similarities in drug targets, different classes of TKI can have similar side effect profile. Not all side effects are associated with every TKI. They can occur at different frequencies depending on the medication. When compared to uh, the chemotherapy agents, TKI seems to have a distinct side effect profile, providing a relatively high therapeutic window with less toxicity than compared to uh, chemotherapy agents. The overall toxicity of TKI is less life-threatening than chemotherapy agents, but they can occur quite commonly and may require, in some cases, dose reduction and, uh, in some cases, a stopping of TKI. Common side effects of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor include fatigue. Other common side effects include gastrointestinal side effects like abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting, or hepatotoxicity. Cardiovascular side effects that include hypertension, hypertension, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction, stroke, or QT interval prolongation. The skin manifestation includes drug reaction or rash, including Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. Hematological side effects include anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. Patients using TKI can develop myalgia or arthralgia. They can have eye side effects like retinopathy or keratitis. Respiratory side effects like pneumonia or interstitial lung disease, renal side effects like proteinuria or renal impairment, neurological side effects of headaches, dizziness, and neuropathy. Endocrine side effects include thyroid dysfunction, adrenal dysfunction, effect on glucose metabolism and bone metabolism, uh, dyslipidemia, osteonecrosis of the jaw, and gonadal dysfunction. 
Coming to thyroid dysfunction, hyperthyroidism is the most commonly reported side effects of TKI. There have been some reports of uh, hyperthyroidism. It's been reported that thyrotoxic phase can occur at a median duration of six weeks, then followed by hyperthyroidism at a median duration of 22 weeks of TKI use. In a meta-analysis uh, of uh, uh, 12 studies, uh, it was shown that the TKI use significantly increased the risk of all-grade hypothyroidism with a relative risk of 3.59. In another review, including 22 patients, which included 1,641 patients, it was shown that 45.8% of the patients developed some form of thyroid dysfunction, 33.2% developed hypothyroidism, 14.8% developed subclinical hypothyroidism, and 3.14% developed hyperthyroidism. A quarter of the patient needed levothyroxine either continuously or temporarily. Hyperthyroidism was not associated with overall survival. However, there were six studies which showed progression-free survival with hypothyroidism. There are two kinds of hypothyroidism which can occur with TKI. The first kind can occur in, uh, in patients who have got pre-existing hypothyroidism and they are well established on levothyroxine. With the use of TKI like imitinib, vindetinib, and sorafenib, the patients uh, uh, can develop high TSH in a reduced T4. The second form uh, 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 is described as uh, de novo hypothyroidism. That is, the patients have got no evidence of uh, hypothyroidism prior to the use of TKI and normal thyroid function. But when TKI like sunitinib, sunifenib, imitinib, desitinib, and exitinib uh, are used, the patients develop hypothyroidism. Sunitinib is associated most frequently with hypothyroidism. However, imitinib is the, the TKI which was first reported to cause hypothyroidism in 2005. In a case series of around eight patients who had thyroidectomy done for medullary thyroid cancer, and they were established, with, uh, established on levothyroxine, when TKI imitinib was used, there was a significant increase in TSH. There was a decrease in free T4 levels, but it remained within the therapeutic range. On average, levothyroxine dose was doubled, but still three out of eight patients only showed a normalization of, level, uh, of uh, thyroid function. In this slide, uh, I've shown uh, some of the common uh, TKIs and uh, the incidence of uh, hypothyroidism uh, with these uh, TKIs, like sunitinib showing hypothyroidism in around 9 to 43% of the patients, lenvitinib showing hypothyroidism in 21 to 80% of the cases. Uh, Cabozantinib showing hypothyroidism in 24 to 50% of the cases. Sorafenib showing uh, evidence of thyroiditis in 7% of the cases with elevation of TSH or T4 in 30% of the cases. There are many mechanisms proposed uh, uh, for TKI-induced hypothyroidism. This depends on the type of hypothyroidism. So in patients uh, who have got normal thyroid function uh, with no evidence of hypothyroidism prior to uh, use of TKI is being proposed that destructive thyroiditis uh, can uh, be one of the reasons for ca causing hypothyroidism. The reason for this proposal is that it's been shown that uh, antithyroglobulin antibodies uh, increase. Uh, so is that uh, the TSH level go, uh, becomes low before the development of hypothyroidism. And also uh, there is evidence of atrophic thyroid tissue and ultrasound. Uh, all thought to be consistent with destructive uh, thyroiditis. Another mechanism uh, which has been proposed is capillary regression induced by VEGF inhibition uh, uh, of T uh, or due to TKI use. Uh, it's been proposed because it's been shown that there's marked shrinkage of thyroid gland during treatment with TKI like sunitinib. Another proposed mechanism is impaired iodine uptake. This is due to the fact that it's been shown that sunitinib uh, can reduce uh, iodine uptake significantly at the end of treatment period um, in one of the studies. Another mechanism includes direct inhibition of th thyroid peroxidase activity. In patients who are taking levothyroxine have got pre-existing hypothyroidism, it's been proposed that there is a decrease in enteric thyroid hormone absorption, increase in hepatic metabolism of T4 and T3, inhibition of T4 deiodination, stimulation of T4 and T3 clearance, or there is interference, interference with thyroid hormone action at pituitary gland level. Most cases of hypothyroidism are mild to moderate, and as a result, 
hypothyroidism uh, is, is not an indication to stop DKI. It's been proposed that TSH and T4 and thyroid antibodies should be measured before the start of treatment, during the treatment, and at the end of the treatment. It's been also been proposed that uh, uh, free T4 should be monitored every three to four weeks for the first six months. The reason being is that patient developing hypothyroidism usually uh, show uh, a rise of uh, T4 levels preceding the development of hyper, uh, hypothyroidism. Patients needing uh, treatment uh, with levothyroxine uh, should be started uh, uh, on levothyroxine. Um, however, it should be kept in mind that uh, the use of levothyroxine could be tempor temporary as thyroid function can recover uh, in some cases uh, when TKI are stopped. Patients with the asymptomatic uh, subclinical hypothyroidism should be managed uh, according to the usual guidance uh, of management of subclinical hypothyroidism. Though uh, in case of TKI, there's no specific guidance. As I have mentioned before, hypothyroidism can occur in a small number of patients. There was an interesting case support of a 57-year-old patient who was treated with sorafenib uh, for uh, uh, lumbar chondroma. Uh, the patient developed hypothyroidism and a positive uh, TSH receptor antibodies. When sorafenib was uh, stopped, uh, the patient uh, uh, hypothyroidism resolved. However, when imitinib was started, the patient again developed Graves' disease. So it was interesting to uh, see that uh, two different uh, TKIs resulted in development of grave disease at two different times in the same patient. As mentioned before, in a review of 22 studies with 1,651 patients, uh, it's been shown that 3.14% of patients can develop hyperthyroidism. Another uh, study of 62 patients uh, who were given sunitinib, thyrotoxicosis preceded hyperthyroidism in around two patients which include around 3.2% uh, of the patients. In two, uh, phase two trials of uh, Zantinib, it's been shown that two patients develop transient toxicosis and then develop hyperthyroidism. If patients develop hyperthyroidism with TKI, they should be managed symptomatically. That is, uh, we should use non-selective beta blockers. If patients develop grave uh, ophthalmopathy, uh, corticosteroids can be used. Thyroid function should be monitored regularly. And the treating physician should be aware that thyroid toxicosis can resolve and the patient can develop hypothyroidism. Coming to adrenal function, uh, there have been reports of adrenal insufficiency described with TKI. Uh, it's been shown in animal study that TKI, like sunitinib, can cause cortical hemorrhage or necrosis in the adrenal gland. Uh, in a study uh, looking at the effect of imitinib on ad adrenal function, it has been shown uh, that uh, 25 patients when given imitinib uh, and evaluated for HPA axis by a glucose, a glucagon stimulation test and a low dose ACTH test, uh, around 48% of the patients uh, had evidence of adrenal insufficiency, uh, suggesting that there's an increased prevalence of subclinical HPA axis dysfunction in patients receiving imitinib. And FDA has also cautioned that while uh, patients using sunitinib does not uh, develop clinically significant adrenal suppression, however, the patient can have unmasking of uh, adrenal uh, insufficiency by concurrent stresses like major surgery, trauma, or infection. In a study published in JCEM by Colombo and team, uh, it was shown that uh, uh, the, uh, 10 out of 12 patients develop fatigue after use with lenvitinib and uh, venditinib. And these 10 patients developed a progressive increase in ACTH level with a normal uh, cortisol level. The adrenal antibodies were negative. These 10 patients were uh, uh, tested uh, with ACTH stimulation. And out of these 10 patients, six patients showed uh, impaired response to uh, ACTH stimulation and one patient developed adrenal crisis after the ACTH test. In another uh, published uh, paper, which looked at uh, uh, the real-world data uh, of side effects reported to Food and Drug Administration Adverse Event, uh, adverse event Reporting System uh, with VEGF uh, 
inhibiting TKIs, uh, and they looked at the effect uh, and the number of adrenal insufficiencies reported uh, to FAERS. There were reports of around 314 adrenal insufficiencies in approximately 150,000 uh, reports. 44.9% of the patients needed hospitalization with adrenal insufficiency. Uh, median time of onset was around 72 days uh, after the start of TKI. Cabozetinib, sunitinib, and exitinib were the most uh, uh, common TKIs reported to cause adrenal insufficiencies. There have been some reports of uh, uh, pezopinib causing adrenal insufficiency. The management of adrenal insufficiencies requires uh, being proactive in symptom monitoring. The patient should be informed uh, that if they develop fatigue, they should report that as uh, uh, adrenal function may need to be tested. And the treatment should be started in patients with documented adrenal insufficiency. And the treating physician, including the patient, should be aware that uh, there can be unmasking of adrenal insufficiency uh, due to stress like surgery or illness. TKIs have also been reported to cause uh, uh, dysfunction of glucose metabolism, and both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia have been reported. TKIs belonging to the same class can lead to both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. The example being nilotinib uh, can induce hyperglycemia in approximately 40% of the cases, whereas uh, desitinib and imitinib uh, have been shown to cause hyperglycemia. The mechanism is uh, uh, unclear and likely specific to each class of TKI. In another study uh, using uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, it's been shown that uh, the blood glucose level decreased significantly. In this study, there were 17 diabetic patients and 61 non-diabetic patients. Uh, so patients with diabetes, uh, in patients with diabetes, there were uh, around 47% of the patients had to stop their medications for diabetes. And when uh, the TKIs were stopped, uh, they had to restart their diabetic medication. One patient developed significant hypoglycemia. Again, the mechanism was unclear. So how should we manage uh, uh, patients with TKI with regards to their glucose metabolism? The patient should be aware that the glucose disturbance can occur. The patient should be educated with regards to symptoms and treatment of hypoglycemia and also osmotic symptoms of hypoglycemia. HB1C should be checked at the start at a regular interval, and, diabetic, uh, and patients with diabetes should uh, uh, be advised to check their blood glucose more frequently. And adjustment of medications may be needed in patients with diabetes, uh, in patients with diabetes mellitus. TKS have also been shown to cause uh, 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 disorder of uh, 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 lipids. And the effect on lipids uh, depends on the type of TKI. It's been shown to uh, improve uh, the lipid uh, uh, levels or uh, worsening of the lipid profile. As a study show, uh, showing imitinib, uh, a, a, a study showed that imitinib uh, improved the lipid profile level significantly. Whereas, 85% uh, 85 out of 155 patients treated with TKI like sunitinib, pezopenib, serafinib, and femitinib uh, developed significant hyperlipidemia. Diagnosis and treatment with TKI uh, of hyperlipidemia is similar to the non TKI related hyperlipidemia. TKIs have also uh, uh, been reported to cause secondary hyperthyroidism. Um, there is a study with imitinib uh, which showed uh, that uh, after four years of treatment uh, with imitinib in 17 CML patients, there was increased incidence of uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism with a normal bone density. In another study uh, where 69% of the patients developed secondary hyperparathyroidism with sunitinib treatment. Uh, in another study, uh, where there is a decrease uh, in, in vitamin D levels and increase in the parathyroid hormone levels noted with uh, ventadinib, ven, uh, ventadinib uh, uh, used in patients with thyroid cancers. Again, the, the management uh, uh, is not very clear and there's no specific guidance. It's been proposed that bone profile, vitamin D, parathyroid hormone levels should be measured at baseline and yearly and bone uh, density should be uh, measured as clinically indicated for that specific patient. 
there have been some rare reports of uh, osteonecrosis of jaw. Uh, the data is quite mixed. Uh, in a study where uh, five patients who were on bisphosphonates and they were treated with senatinib, they developed osteonecrosis of jaw. In another retrospective study, using TKIs like sonitinib and sonitinib, the risk of uh, developing uh, osteonecrosis of jaw is around 1.1% with bisphosphonate. Again, there is no specific guidance with regards to how we should manage these patients. Um, however, uh, the treating physician should be aware of a small increase in the risk of osteonecrosis of jaw, especially in patients with bisphosphonates. There have been some reports of uh, TKI having an effect on uh, growth hormone, uh, especially with m which has been linked with growth, growth hormone deficiency. In a study of around 17 patients uh, who were treated with uh, m uh, it's been shown that 70% of the patients uh, had evidence of severe growth hormone deficiency uh, when uh, they were tested with glucon, uh, glucagon stimulation test. Uh, in children's studies, they've been shown that uh, the, uh, the children uh, treated with TKI have reduced height, and the severity depends on uh, the younger age at the start of treatment. The mechanism uh, is still not clear, but it's been proposed that it is due to either growth hormone secretion or direct effect on the pituitary gland. With regards to the treatment of growth hormone deficiency, it's been uh, uh, recommended that uh, the patients with malignancy should not be started on growth hormone. The reason being that the growth hormone has been shown to play a role in malignant transformation and progression of variety of cancers like breast, lung, and cancer and colon. Therefore, uh, growth hormone treatment is not recommended uh, in these patients. TKS have also been shown to have an effect on marital function. In males, it's been shown that uh, there is a reduced testosterone levels. So in patients uh, uh, who were treated with uh, bezoprenib, sonitinib, and exitinib, it's been shown that 77% uh, of the patients develop hypogonadism with the odd ratio of hypogonadism at uh, more than 30 months, uh, it was around 12.1. Uh, in another study with uh, crizotinib, 19 out of 19 patients develop hypogonadism uh, however, the level returned to normal on stopping uh, chrysotinib. There have been some evidence that uh, patients uh, who are treated with, with male patients treated with, uh, with uh, TKIs can develop uh, gynecomastia. Uh, there have been a study looking at the effect of uh, emetinib uh, on the testosterone uh, in 38, males, uh, 38 men uh, uh, with uh, CML. 18% uh, of the patient developed gynecomastia, and it was associated with the significant decrease in testosterone concentration. However, there is no uh, effect on male fertility in humans uh, with TKI. The mechanism is still unclear, and it is proposed that it's either due to central effect on the pituitary or the gonadal effect. In females, there is some animal studies which reports uh, that there may be an adverse effect on ovarian function, like with sunitinib, it's been shown in animal studies that they decrease corpus luteal number and the serum AMH level is also reduced. However, with imitinib, there's no effect on fertilization rate or ovulation. Uh, ovulation. Uh, with regards to gonadal function, especially in females, further evaluation and studies are required. However, it should be, uh, uh, however, the physician should be aware that uh, long-term treatment with TKI could impact significantly the ovarian reserve and the fetus development. Therefore, uh, uh, it is recommended that strategies are, in, uh, are looked at to preserve the fertility uh, from the time of diagnosis of cancer. So in conclusion, uh, endocrine side effects are usually uh, graded as one or two, which is mild or moderate. It is very rare uh, that they are severe or uh, critical. Uh, therefore, treatment with TKI uh, is usually not interrupted and the patient can continue taking TKI if they develop endocrine side effects. Uh, it is also helped by the fact that if physicians are aware of these side effects, they can start the treatment or uh, adjust the dose of TKI rather than stopping the, the TKIs. The patient should also be educated to look out for symptoms like fatigue or symptoms for hyperglycemia or osmotic symptoms uh, for hyperglycemia. It's been proposed that TSH, T4, HB1C, and lipid, lipid profile should be measured at baseline. And further uh, investigations 
uh, it usually depends on the type of TKI used. Thank you very much. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fahad. So we have uh, two excellent virtual uh, talks. Uh, our next talk is on prolactinoma, comparing local with international experience. Dr. Hira Irfan, a consultant endocrinologist, Shokat Khanam Cancer Hospital and Research Center, uh, will conduct this talk. And we will have panelists, uh, Dr. Rahila Khwaja and Dr. Fahad Bali Ahmed. They both uh, have joined us virtually. Over to you, Dr. Hira. Can you hear me? So uh, I'm Dr. Hira Irfan, working as a consultant endocrinologist in Shah Khanam Hospital. Today, I'll be discussing our center experience of treating prolactinoma and then its comparison with the international data. So I'll start with a little introduction about prolactinoma. Prolactinoma is the prolactin secreting pituitary adenoma, and it accounts for the uh, 40 to 60 percent of all the pituitary adenomas, and up to 80 percent if we include microadenoma in it. Mean prevalence is 10 per 100,000 in men and 30 per 100,000 in women, making it more prevalent in females as compared to the men, with a male to female ratio of one is to three. Uh, the clinical features of the prolactinoma are due to overproduction of the prolactin and its mass effect. Uh, due to overproduction of the prolactin, it causes a hormonal imbalance leading to inhibition of the gonadotropins and then uh, menstrual abnormalities, galactoria and infertility in, men, in women and uh, erectile dysfunction, infertility and decreased libido in males. Uh, both men and women can present with the uh, clinical features of mass effects, headache and vomiting and the, both of them can have uh, visual disturbances. Along with that, we can also see some neuro, uh, neurological manifestations with prolactinoma in the form of uh, psychosis, anxiety, and sleep dis disturbances. Women are relatively younger at presentation than the men. This is due to the subtle symptoms of hypogonadism in men. They present late with the mass effects like uh, symptoms of headache, visual disturbance, and vomiting. Peak prevalence for women aged between 25 to 34 years of age. Uh, diagnosis of prolactinoma relies on the clinical features, uh, prolactin level, and MR, uh, findings of pituitary adenoma on MRI scan. Prolactin level should be raised to a significant uh, value before diagnosed, labeling the patient as having prolactinoma. According to endocrine society guidelines, a prolactin level greater than 94 nanogram per milliliter can safely differentiate prolactinoma from other causes of hyperprolactinemia. Then in the end, magnetic resonance imaging is the gold standard for the diagnosis of adenoma. Uh, we also get med, uh, MRI to look for the dimensions of the adenoma and size of the adenoma, and then in the follow-up visits to look for the uh, treat, uh, treatment response uh, of the cabagaline agonist, cabagulines. Uh, then uh, in the MRI, in, on the basis of the MRI, we categorize the micro, uh, prolactinoma as microadenoma, macroadenoma, and giant prolactinoma. Uh, medical management is the mainstay of uh, prolact uh, prolactinoma treatment. In the medical management, uh, we have dopamine agonists. Dopamine agonists acts, acts on the D2 receptors on the pituitary electrotrophs that causes the inhibition of prolactin and decreases the tumor size. In dopamine agonists, the most commonly used ones are the bromocyptine and cabergoline. Uh, bromocyptin was first made in 1965 by Sandoz, and since then it has been widely used till the discovery of cabergoline in 1919. Bromocyptine was approved by FDA in, 19, in 1985. And then after the cabergoline was uh, introduced in 1990s, there were numerous studies done in the Western population to look for the efficacy of cabergoline. And it was found that cabergoline is superior to bromocyptine in prolactin normalization and decreasing the size of the tumor. Um, but unfortunately in Pakistan, we have limited availability of cabergoline. So in majority of our patients, we use bromocyptine. Uh, due to the non-availability of cabergoline, no uh, pharmaceutical company in the Pakistan has licensed for, 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 for uh, selling uh, cabergoline. So uh, then comes the second line management, which includes surgery and radiotherapy. In surgery, transphenoidal su uh, surgery is favored among other approaches, uh, and radiotherapy is preserved only the, for the selected patients in which surgery is not possible or there is not, uh, there, there's still a significant number of the tumor present after the surgery. 
So clinical data with regards to baseline characteristics, clinical features, management, and outcome in polyectinoma has been extensively studied in the Western population. The literature from the low income or low middle class countries is lacking. We performed a retrospective analysis of the patients in our hospital. Patients from January 2011 to December 2019 were extracted from hospital database. This study aimed to determine the clinical presentation, treatment modalities, and therapeutic outcomes of the patients with prolactinoma in our region. The aim of this study was to provide a reference study, which can be which can taken as a guideline for the management of prolactinoma in our region. Uh, all the patients of age greater than 18 with the radiological evidence of pituitary adenoma and prolactin level greater than 94 were included in the study. And the patients who had prior pituitary surgery or other causes of hyperprolactinoma, such as pituitary stock effect, co-security pituitary adenomas, infiltrative diseases like sarcoidosis or tuberculosis, a patient taking certain medications, and pregnant females were all excluded from these studies. So we total have 107 patients. Among them, 71 were female and 36 were male. Uh, mean age among male was 35 and among females was 32. We can see that uh, females presented relatively earlier than the men. Uh, then we use cabergolin is 59 percent of the patients and 34 patients had bromocyptine. And there were 14 patients who received both medications at some point during the treatment. In some patients, we have to change bromocyptine to cabergolin due to the drug side effect. Or, uh, and in few patients, we have to change cabergolin to bromocyptine due to the drug non-availability. We have allowed 50% of the patients with macroadenoma and 35% of the patients with microadenoma. And we also have 19 patients of giant prolactinoma, around 17% of, of our study population was of giant prolactinoma. The median prolactin level before treatment was 510 nanogram per milliliter. Uh, Pre-treatment tumor size was a mean of 2.18. And we followed the patients for a median of 40 months. Uh, if we look at this table, we can see that majority of, the, of our patients had uh, the most common clinical features among our patients was headache, which was reported in 61 patients. And if we look at the, on, the, uh, on this table, we can see that in the males, the most common uh, clinical feature was visual disturbance. 80% of the male presented with the visual disturbance. And the most common clinical features among female was uh, menstrual irregularities. 73.2% of the patient, female patients presented with menstrual irregularities, followed by galactoria. And in three uh, male and three female patients, we also have incidental pituitary adenomas. We uh, in the we can see in this table that majority of the females presented with 30 uh, with microadenoma. 35 females have microadenoma, and only three male have microadenoma. And uh, micro, 32 females have macroadenoma and giant prolactinoma was more common in men. Uh, 15 male patients have giant prolactinoma as compared to only four patients, uh, female patients with giant prolactinoma. The prolactin level at the diagnosis was positively correlated with the maximum tumor, tumor, tumor diameter. We assess the outcome in terms of biochemical response, radiological response, and clinical response. A biochemical response was defined as prolactin normalization after starting uh, dopamine agonist therapy, and radiological response was 50% reduction in tumor size on follow-up MRI images, or no uh, tumor seen on the last documented MRI scan. And the clin clinical response was improvement in the clinical symptoms or uh, complete resolution of clinical symptoms. If we look at the data on the biochemical uh, outcome, we'll see that significant prolactin reduction was seen within six to 12 months of starting patients with dopamine agonists. Mean prolactin level decreased from 3,000 to 1.5 to nanogram per milliliter. Within two years, 73.2% of the patients cause, uh, has prolactin normalization, and the majority of these patients have received cabergoline. Uh, biochemical response with cabergoline was 83.3%, and with bromocyptin was only 63.3%. This is a graph showing the normal prolactinemia in the follow-up visits. We can see that uh, within six months of starting dopamine agonists, 50% of the patients had no prolactin normalization, and this increased to 73.2% of the patient and in the, in within two years. And uh, the last documented follow-up, 80% uh, of the patients had prolactin normalization. 
uh, mean tumor size at the time of the diagnosis decreased from 2.18 centimeter to 1.04 centimeters measured on the last documented follow up after starting cavagulin uh, dopamine agonist therapy at the two years follow up visits 45.8% had more than 50% reduction in the tumor size and this response increased to 62.2% if dopamine agonist therapy was con was continued to more than two years uh, 65 percent uh, cases receiving cabergulin showed the radiological response, and 60 percent patients receiving bromocyptin showed the radiological response. We also observed a uh, complete resolution of uh, adenoma in 13 patients. 11 of these patients received cabergulin, and two patients received bromocyptin. And most of uh, majority of these uh, patients were of microadenoma. We also looked for clinical outcome, improvement, or resolution of the clinical symptoms was seen in 74.5% of the patients in six to 12 months of starting patients with dopamine agonist. And this response increased to 92.9% on the last documented clinical follow-up. Now this table shows the comparison between cabergulin and bromocyptine in achieving outcomes in the form of biochemical, uh, radiological and clinical response. We can see that cabergulin was superior to bromocyptine in achieving biochemical or clinical response, but there was not much different in the uh, radiological response. 65% of the patients receiving cabergulin and 60% of the patients receiving bromocyptine had uh, tumor shrinkage. Uh, this is the comparison of microadenoma to macroadenoma and joint prolactinoma. Uh, we can see in the microadenoma, 91.7% showed a patient showed biochemical response, whereas in giant prolactinoma, only 53% of the patients showed biochemical response. And the clinical response was 94.4% in microadenoma and only 77.8% in giant prolactinoma. And there was not much difference in the radiological response, but still in microadenoma, 66.7% of the patients had tumor shrinkage and only 55.6% of the patients with giant prolactinoma has tumor shrinkage. We also looked for recurrence or, and we also looked for remission in the patients after starting on dopamine agonist. Dopamine agonist withdrawal was attempted in eight cases. And these were, these, all of these eight cases was, were of microadenoma. In, out of these eight cases, in five cases, we had to restart uh, dopamine agonist therapy due to the rise in the polyclin level again, or appearance of the clinical symptoms. And three patients remain, are still uh, on follow-up and are, they didn't show any signs of recurrence and they are off dopamine agonist therapy. Eight cases of macroadenoma were kept at lowest possible doses of dopamine agonist, and there was no recurrence of tumor on lower suppressive doses. GI side effects were observed in eight cases, uh, and in those eight cases, we have to switch bromocyptin to cabergulin due to the patient were unable to tolerate uh, bromocyptin due to GI side effects. We also uh, observed that we had two patients, one with uh, giant prolactinoma and one with macroadenoma. Uh, all these two cases presented with rare complication of uh, prolactinoma, which is cerebrospinal fuller rhinorrhea. All of these patients started uh, presented within one month of starting dopamine agonist. And in both patients, we repaired uh, defect and they are doing fine. Uh, now, this, slides, uh, this slide is about the comparison of our study with the international data available. Um, the first study was by Webster et al. This study, this is one of the earliest studies in which they compared the efficacy of cabergulin to bromocyptin. This study was done in 1994 in Wales, UK. And in, in its study, it enrolled 459 cases, all of were female of hyper. And in these 459 cases, 223 patients received cabergulin and 236 patients received bromocyptin. Then another study which was done by Erdok et al. in 2014, this was done in Central Italy. It enrolled 498 patients. Out of these, 48 were male and 450 were female. And cabergulin was given to 450 patients and bromocyptin was given to 48 patients. Then another meta-analysis was done in Israel. This was by Tiroche and done in 2015. And they only used cabergulin. Uh, it enrolled uh, 309 subjects and all of uh, 191 were male and 118 were female. Then another study was done by Yan. This was done in China and it enrolled all the patients with giant prolactinoma. It enrolled 104 patients. Out of these, uh, 53 patients were given cabergulin and 51 patients were given, give, were given bromocyptin. And then other, and our study, which was done in Lahore in Shafa Khanam Hospital, we enrolled 107 patients and 59 patients received cabergulin and 34 patients uh, received bromocyptin. 
Uh, if we look at the biochemical response, we can see that our data is comparable to the studies done in the Western population. Uh, our study showed the biochemical response with Cabal Green to 83.3%, uh, whereas the studies done by Webster uh, biochemical response was 83%, by uh, Arduk it was 87.4%. But our studies are not, uh, our data regarding the radiological response in our population was not comparable to the international uh, studies being done. Uh, with Cabal Green, we had a, a response of 65.4% in tumor shrinkage, whereas by other studies, it showed 79.8%. And uh, this study, uh, which, is, uh, which you can see here by Yan Hung, uh, it shows a re uh, decreased biologic, biochemical response and radiological response because this study was done uh, on giant polyclinomas and its results are similar to our studies. We can see the in giant polyctinoma biochemical response was seen in 53% of the patient and radiological response in 55.6% of the patient. But still, our radiological response was not comparable to the done by Yan. Uh, it has a radiological response of 76% with cabergoline and bromocyptin uh, 90%. Now, our study has certain limitations. First of all, it was a, a retrospective analysis. Secondly, it was a single center cohort study. So this study cannot be used as a reference for the treatment of polyactinoma in our region. We need a large number of the population from other centers as well to make a guideline for treatment of polyactinoma. Uh, then limited availability of cabergoline, the cost of laboratory and radiological investigations, and the fewer follow-up visits of the patients. Because uh, we are a charity hospital where we enroll patients from all over the Pakistan, and some patients are from Afghanistan. So uh, their follow-up is limited because of the visa issues. Uh, they usually don't come to follow up and then they don't adhere to medical therapy. So our poor response in some of our patients can be due to this, uh, these reasons. Um, we concluded that bromocryptine being cost effective is still being widely used in our region and we found it inferior to cabergoline. Cabergoline should be switched to, uh, cabergoline should be used as a first line therapy or bromocryptine should be switched to cabergoline if desirable treatment response is not available. Patients should be followed up at regular interval even after stopping dopamine agonist therapy to look for the recurrence or to look for the side effects of uh, dopamine agonist therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hera. Uh, so now I will request our panelists, Dr. Rahila Khwaja and Dr. Fahad Bali Ahmed, if they have any question or comment regarding our experience, uh, they can uh, they can share now. Dr. Fahad and Dr. Rahila, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Can you can you can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon. We can hear you. All right. So nice presentation. Um, both the presentations were very nice. So uh, what I can share with you for prolactinoma, what we have been using here is basically carbergoline. Uh, Bromocryptine is use is very, very limited. And um, so ours is like totally, because of course cost and follow up and all those kind of things are, are different. So we start all our patients, of course we rule out that hypothyroidism and all that, which you guys also probably do that. But if you are comparing the treatment choices, so we definitely start with carbergoline with the low dose uh, uh, twice a week. And then usually we increase the dose based upon the follow up. But of course we do the follow up much sooner and four weeks to six weeks and then three months. And if the patient's uh, clinical response and the radiological response is good, then uh, uh, we decrease the dose. And for two years, if they, their um, uh, levels are okay, clinically they are doing okay, then of course we, we stop the medication, but we still follow these patients. Um, I hope that helps. But um, I, I was not sure. I thought there were some... Um, these ergot derivatives, uh, derivatives are some uh, other ones than carbergoline were available in some other countries. I'm not sure what is available in Pakistan, but of course ours is Dostinex or carbergoline is the, is the treatment of choice here, even for micro or macro adenoma. Or even if the patient has is having some visual problems, 
usually the surgery, transphenoidal surgery is, is very, very limited role. Uh, we start with the Dustin X first. The only those big tumors, which giant prolactinomas, um, we see it rarely, but usually we start again, those patients also with the low dose, because I think she mentioned about that CSF rhinorrhea, especially those tumors which are sitting lower, there is a chance for um, um, uh, CSF rhinorrhea. So we start with the lower dose and then we build it up for those patients, keeping an eye on their prolactin levels. I hope it helps. No, thank you. Uh, oh, thank Rahar. you. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Vakas. Um, yeah, the, both presentations were very excellent uh, by Dr. Rahila and Dr. Hera. I think from our experience, uh, uh, basically I've trained in UK, so most of the time we have used cabergoline uh, for treatment of uh, prolactinoma, micro and macro both. We start at a lower dose and then we increase uh, uh, the dose of the medication as per the patient response, uh, clinically, uh, biochemically and radiologically. Uh, with regards to bromocyptine, we used to use it uh, in patients who were uh, thinking of conceiving uh, uh, or who become pregnant. But I think with the emerging data with regards to the safety of cabergoline, even though it's still the numbers are still less with regards to the published data, but I think we have had a lot of patients where we have treated the patients were on cabergoline, they remained on cabergoline, or we kind of stopped it uh, uh, when the patients were pregnant. Uh, and the safety data is, is becoming more and more stronger. Uh, otherwise, before we used to basically convert the patients to bromocyptine and then uh, uh, the patient would conceive and then we'll stop uh, bromocyptine. But now uh, my usual practice is that I usually don't stop it. Uh, 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 and once they conceive, then we stop it. Um, and I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Rahila with regards to uh, the follow-up management and increasing the dose. Uh, until as the patients have severe side effects with cabergoline, uh, then we may think of changing to either bromocyptine to, or other derivatives uh, like coanagulide. Uh, I remember, I think we had a patient in our uh, uh, clinic who uh, had a significant uh, psychiatric disorder with uh, uh, cabergoline. And as soon as we stopped it, uh, it improved. The patient did not have any psychiatric disorder beforehand. Patient actually became suicidal. Uh, and on uh, and the patient was then changed to quina quinagulide. Uh, and the patient had uh, some depression, but they uh, not suicidal, uh, suicidal ideation. So as a result, I think, uh, you know, you, you can change the medication according to uh, the patient response and side effects. But uh, our experience is mainly with uh, cabergoline, uh, more so than any other medication. Uh, thank you. Right, thank you, uh, both Dr. Rahida and Dr. Fahad. Um, a brief point uh, Dr. Hira mentioned in terms of coming off uh, cabergoline or bromocryptine after treatment. Um, how successfully are you managing to get your patients off these medications? Um, or if there's a certain duration, you would like to give a trial of coming off medication, um, depending on the response. I think either one of you can answer if you have uh, experienced that. Yes, so, yes, so uh, we, again, we do follow these patients um, and sometimes some, like we keep them for on a medication for at least a year or two on a low dose, but we follow their levels. Some of the patients, some of my patients actually, they have been, we were able to take them off, but again, we still follow them up even afterwards, just to see if it comes back. And their clinical uh, uh, clinical symptoms are important if they're, they're female patients, if they're again having some menstrual irregularities. Most of our patients, when the prolactin is done, you know, it's, it's like uh, very difficult to see. Some patients that just have mild hyperprolactinemia means up to 50 nanogram per ml, but there's no evidence of uh, any uh, microadenoma even on the MRIs. So those patients sometimes, and they are having, because of that um, uh, idiopathic hyperprolactinemia, they are having some menstrual irregularities, especially the female patients. Uh, so we, we do give them for a short period of time, this Dostin X and see if it helps and then lower the dose, keep them for six months and then see what their response is like, whether they, they, they stay okay, their menstrual cycle is normal. They, we cannot find um, any reason uh, well, besides the antipsychotic medications, I remember one of my patients was on verapamil and cimetidine, um, uh, which, which both are reported as they can cause some mild hyperprolactinemia. So we stopped 
one patient on those medications is rare. SSRI, as you know, they are the most common, which, which, which we then discuss with a um, uh, psychiatrist to change the medications because of course they have, we need their help to change the medications if the patient can tolerate uh, other, other psych medications. Um, but other than that, I, again, we just follow those patients. Usually they say if the patient stays, um, stays with the normal clinical and um, uh, radiologically, they are fine. You can keep them, um, you can make sure they stay okay for two years and then on a lowest dose. And then you, you basically have to follow these patients and then see what, what, what happens afterwards. And if of course the patient becomes, if it's a female becomes pregnant, Usually we tell the patients before they get pregnant, but I agree like uh, the newer studies have shown that Dostin X also is safe. Uh, but of course, during pregnancy, we like patients not to be on any medication um, if, if we can avoid that. So the, the main reason we conducted this study was that initially we were not very comfortable uh, using a bromocryptin because me and Dr. Ahmed never had experience of using bromocryptin, but this study, uh, which we did, gave us some confidence that actually bromocryptin does work. It doesn't work as good as cabagaline, but at least it worked. Uh, so that was a positive thing for us. Um, so now we got uh, 10, um, in fact, nine minutes remaining. So I think we will start with question and answer for the first uh, two talks. Um, so my first question uh, will be from for Dr. Rahila. Um, Dr. Rahila, is there any role of uh, radio frequency ablations for uh, thyroid nodules in your so, experience? So we don't do it, but for the cystic nodules, uh, uh, but they have said that you can do it, but it's not a common practice um, uh, to use. Uh, the common practice is Bas uh, uh, basically doing the FNA, uh, if, if the size criteria and the characteristics uh, of that particular nodule, they, they qualify for those. So that is the first thing to do. Uh, but, uh, but very rarely, I mean, we have not used to be very honest in our, at Ohio State, the radio frequency or um, any of those like ethanol injections, but it has been, it has been published and it has been reported also, uh, but very, very rare. I will also request from the audience if they have any question, they can come to the mic. Uh, uh, that mic. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Dr. Asim Alvi and I am a fellow endocrinology from Shafat Khanam Hospital, Lahore. Uh, my first question is with uh, Dr. Fahad that uh, is there any role of antithyroid drugs for uh, treatment of hyperthyroidism uh, related to uh, TKIs? Thank you, thank you. So uh, in general, I think uh, with my uh, review of uh, all the articles, I think I, I couldn't find any case where antithyroid medication was used uh, until unless the patients develop Graves' disease. Um, the reason being is the majority of the time, this is due to thyroiditis and usually patient will go through hyperthyroid phase and then the patient will develop hyperthyroidism. And that's usually the majority of the patients. There's a small proportion of patients who may develop uh, uh, persistent hyperthyroidism. So in majority of the patients, uh, it probably will resolve and will end up being hyperthyroid. So usually symptomatic management uh, should be done. And again, basis, so based on the clinical uh, judgment that if the patient is extremely symptomatic and uh, uh, clinically it seems that this patient will remain persistently hyperthyroid, uh, then uh, the role can be, uh, there can be a role uh, for antithyroid. But majority of the time uh, with regards to the case review, and even in my experience, I think few patients I've seen here in, in, in uh, King Faisal, where they, even if they go through hyperthyroid phase, they usually are hyperthyroid by the time they come to my clinic. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think there is kind of a rush to do that. I think symptomatically these patients can be managed. And I think if this persists, then we can consider uh, using antithyroid medication because there have been uh, some case reports of uh, Graves' disease developing with TKI uh, as uh, I've presented in my talk. Thank you. And my second question is with uh, Dr. Rahila. What are your recommendations for category three and four uh, nodules for centers where genetic studies are not available? 
a good question. Yes, that's what I was. Um, so basically, I, I know you guys don't have it. So historically, we had been doing the same like lobectomies or thyroidectomies, depending upon the number of nodules that has been had been a previous practice. There was no other test available. But because Ephrema is the one actually we are using a lot at Ohio State University for, for these kind of categories. Um, so now, because of the availability of these tests, of course, we are avoiding those diagnostic lobectomies or diagnostic surgeries. I think at your place, because you don't have that availability, so probably that's what you guys are doing and that's what probably you need to do. Um, so yeah, that's what it had been a common practice here. Here we get actually the insurance, majority of the insurance companies that do cover that Pharma test. Um, uh, uh, I did not have even, uh, even if it does not, then the Verisite is the company that they sometimes waive the, uh, uh, the price, the fee for these tests and they usually do it. But majority of the time uh, our tests are covered by the insurance companies and we never had a problem. But if you don't have it, then I think you don't have a choice at this point. Um, there was one paper, if I remember correctly, for these patients to do the thyroid uptake and scan to see if it's a cold lesion or a hot lesion, even if the TSH was uh, 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 normal. Normally, we don't do thyroid uptake and scan. So there was one, I think, paper I remember like a few years ago uh, that, okay, if it's a cold nodule, indeterminate, then do the, do the surgery. But, but that's not the practice anymore. So nobody does that. So I don't think so if it's a valid option to do it or it's a, it's a, a FDA approved option to do it that way. So, and can I comment on this? Um, the, uh, you mentioned about this um, hyperthyroidism and treatment with antithyroid medication. So I'm not sure if what is more expensive in Pakistan if to get the um, uh, TSI, like thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins for grapes versus uptake and scan because some of these patients, they have, like um, Dr. Fahad was uh, explaining, they, they have thyroiditis, which goes back to hypothyroid or become euthyroid uh, after that thyrotoxic phase. So I'm not sure if, if any of those tests you can do over there and how expensive they are. I know cost is a big issue in Pakistan. Um, if that will guide you, if this patient has thyroiditis to begin with, or it is hyperthyroidism and they need some kind of intervention. So I'll leave it up to you guys, whatever is cost effective there. Both, both, I mean, both, yeah. both tests are available, but uh, uh, thyroid scan is easily available in our center. I see. Okay. All right. I don't know if that might help you to differentiate between thyroiditis and hyperthyroidism to decide if the patient, if you can just sit on this patient and it's going to go back to normal or if you need some, some things to be done. And my third question and last question to all the panel uh, from third uh, presentation, that uh, how to differentiate between pseudo and true prolactinoma? As I have seen few patients with significantly raised prolactin levels with stock effect and uh, not very much raised prolactin level because of pituitary apoplexy and cystic component of uh, prolactinoma in uh, true prolactinoma. So how we can deal these problem in cl clinical practice? We'll request Dr. Hira to come on the mic. greater than 94 can differentiate prolactinoma from all other causes of hyperprolactinoma. Secondly, uh, taking a good history uh, will also help us in uh, differentiating those patients because the uh, prolactinoma patients have the significant salient features of clinical presentation. So we can diagnose the patients on the basis of clinical features and prolactin levels, and then there will be a, a evidence of adenoma on the MRI scan. Yes, I have seen, uh, uh, like if there is non-secretory uh, non pituitary adenoma, and uh, because of stock effect, there are uh, significantly raised prolactin level. And patient also symptomatic with these prolactin levels. So, so how we can differentiate? Uh, sometimes differentiation is not possible. So we treat the patient with uh, docinex cabagoline, and at the same time, uh, we can plan for the surgery of the patient if, the visual, if there is any visual disturbance or the tumor is large enough to cause the side effects. And the histopathology of, of the specific... I can hear you, Dr. Rahira. Hello. I, uh, hello. Because I could not, I could not hear 
Uh, I can hear you, but I think uh, the, the maybe the conference was an event it may have been kind of oh, having a problem. So I believe. Hear... Okay, I cannot hear them. Not... No, I. Okay. No, no. Okay. So what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> I think wait for them to finish, and I think I'll just message Vakas to find out uh, if he's. Sure. Yeah. Okay. It was nice, nice talking to you. Here, same here, an excellent presentation. Uh, and I think what time is it at your place? Oh, it's now five, five in the morning, five thirty-one. Five. Oh dear. Yeah. At least it's Sunday. So. <laughs> yeah, at least it's Sunday. Yeah. Actually, we had a one-hour time change also in the uh, ah, like, okay. at two in the morning. So that gave me an extra hour of sleep. Maybe I think they're coming on. Let's.